Emma, hey, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Uh, it's really good to have you here. We're starting our videos by asking contributors to introduce themselves and give us an overview of their work. So would you mm -hmm. mind doing that, please? Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name's Emma Franklin, and I'm a artist who works in theater. Um, I'm a performer and a writer and a director, um, and I guess the last seven years, the last decade really, my work's been um, focused on um, responding to issues around gender transition, um, responding to my own transition um, and the kind of politics around that, the politics surrounding trans bodies and um, our lives. Um, but also, you know, I've made a musical version of Ghostbusters, the film. Um, I reserve the rights to make stuff that is also not about that. Um, and, you know, we've been working together for maybe five years now um, on and off um, around Galatea, which is an early modern um, text and that's been really great because you know my background was always in classical theatre and ever since I kind of graduated in classical theatre I have exclusively not worked in classical theatre professionally and so I think our work together has been a really wonderful way of coming coming back to that but you know bringing everything that um, br bringing my practice into it as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, one of the things I, I, I mean, I adore working with you in lots of different ways. One of the things I really value about working with you is that we think of, of classical theatre or early modern theatre as very mainstream and traditional, um, mm. expensive, both in budget and in access. Whereas actually, um, I think it's much closer to the kind of work that you do, which is radically accessible um, and usually not centred around kind of mainstream um, traditions. Um, before we talk about that, oh, can we hear a bit more about Ghostbusters? Because <laughs> I know that's your favourite <laughs> film, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, me and two friends, um, no, actually it was my friends. They, I was curating a festival that was happening um, uh, outdoors in caravans and camper vans and tents. It was called The Campsite. It was like a little pop-up festival for sort of small and intimate performance. Um, and I'd asked my friend, um, Katie Shute, if uh, she wanted to put something on. And she said, oh, I'm thinking of making a musical version of Ghostbusters. And I was like, well, you can put it on, but I have to be in it. Um, <laughs> and then had this crazy week where I was curating a festival and putting on my own show, Don Quixote, which we were making at the time, uh, and also <laughs> inserting myself into this um, musical adaptation of Ghostbusters, which um, was wildly successful. We took it to Edinburgh twice. I've never made more money on a show um, than I did with that up at the Fringe. We did it on the Free Fringe. And like, you, I've never had a show up there as well, which would um, flyer itself. We would just walk out in our costumes and people would come up to us and go, what's the show? Can I have a, <laughs> can I have a flyer? Um, but it was a very faithful um, fan tribute musical where we, we uh, wrote songs we went through it was very kind of shot for shot lovingly done and it was very stupid it was very stupid it was great <laughs> messy great i got you i got to play um goza among other parts um goza for those who are not as familiar with the film <laughs> as maybe they ought to be is the um the God at the end of the film who becomes a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man um, and Goza is a uh, sort of trans um, ambiguously gendered character um, which I think like many things going back and reconnecting with Ghostbusters and being like huh there's this whole bit in there of like oh Goza I thought Goza was a guy yeah Goza's a god they can be anything they want to be um, which I found kind of inspiring yeah. and then I took that into my roller derby name which is Go Go Goza. <laughs> very good um that film absolutely terrified me as a kid i'm very impressed anyone can have anything other than a uh <laughs> negative not negative but i mean i was i was completely traumatized by that movie <laughs> it was supposed to do you know what's really great though is that um my son joey around the time that we were doing it for the second time he was maybe three or three or four years old um and so he was aware that i was in ghostbusters and it was around the same time as the um, remake was coming out, um, the Paul Feig remake with, um, um, with the female Ghostbusters. Um, and he 
confused the show that I was in with the major Hollywood reboot of the Ghostbusters franchise. And to this day, he thinks that I am Holtzman in uh, the new Ghostbusters movie. Uh, which is absolutely brilliant. And I'm not, not deliberately not telling him because I hope he gets to be an embarrassing age when he turns around and says, oh yeah, like my parent was in that. And someone's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I promise I won't keep deferring us getting onto the, the center of the conversation, but you also mentioned Don Quixote and I feel we should hear a little bit about, about that as I well. Right. Ghostbusters was the center of the conversation. Oh, well, yeah, obviously um, we've, we've now done the center. We're now moving on. <laughs> Don Quixote was a really big show for me, I guess, in terms of um, career-wise. Um, I made it um, in collaboration with my brother, Kier Cooper, who I often collaborate with. Kier's a, a musician and a theatre maker, and um, Kier's music like, pretty much always um, influences and comes into my work. But this was a show that Kier and I, uh, from the start, set out to make a show together, and quite, um, <laughs> like, foolishly and boldly and retrospectively retrospectively perfectly given what Don Quixote is um we're like okay let's make an adaptation of Don Quixote I've never read it like but everyone likes it so it must be kind of good um and we spent a couple of years really getting into it and what we found was kind of like um how I feel really with regards to a lot of early modern work and Cervantes of course is a contemporary of Shakespeare and allegedly born and died on the same days right as Shakespeare um, and in Spain on Shakespeare and Cervantes birthday they celebrate both of these great writers and all writers and of course in England being who we are we celebrate Shakespeare only <laughs> um, but um, going back and going okay well what is this book that I've never read but I kind of feel like I know it already and I know it from windmills and tea towels and that Elvis song um, and isn't it funny and then actually reading it and um, learning about Cervantes and being like hell here's this guy who um, you know lost his arm fighting for his country and then he didn't have any money and he was destitute and he was thrown in prison and that's why he started writing this book and thinking wow like does it seem likely that those are the circumstances where you're just going to write this sort of hilarious rom? And actually, the more we kind of, um, the, the more we, we went into the project, the more we kind of felt, actually, this is someone who's saying, have a dream but if, and try and change the world. But if you do that, be aware of how society treats dreamers. Um, and so our production um, took Quixote, but also we brought in more contemporary Quixotes and the idea of what it is to be a Quixote, um, being an individual who says no and stands up to the system. But often these individuals um, are, well, often they are killed or they kill themselves or they are imprisoned or society um, shits on them in, in some kind of way. Um, and that production was, I mean, I'd love to go back and do it again, if, um, honestly. Um, it ended up being me and Kia and Carlos Otero, who's a, um, a queer flamenco artist. Um, and it was like, um, we had a guest performer who would play the part of Quixote every um, night and it would open with them. You saw it, right? One time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it would open with them doing this kind of beautiful sequence and everyone would think, oh, okay, great. This is Don Quixote. It's very serious theater. Um, and then they would uh, dress themselves in cardboard armor and then they would ch choose a member of the audience and they would say to the audience member, uh, what's your name? Um, would you like to come on an, an adventure with me? <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the audience member would hopefully say yes. And then the audience member and the guest performer would leave the theater and they would go out of the theater off across the road. They would go to a pub or wherever we could find and they would have sit and have a conversation for an hour about how to change the world. And then meanwhile, we would then take the rest of the audience on this kind of journey inside. And then the two parts of the story would come back together. Um, and I think there was something so, oh, we, you know, we saw that I took a circular saw to a copy of Don Quixote and we sawed it up. It ended up shredded everywhere. Like it was a completely, um, it was a completely crazy experience. Anyway, that was that show. And that show, um, got into the British Council Showcase in 2013, which led to us touring it to Brazil. And that really was the start of my international 
career as well. And I think that was a, a really pivotal moment in terms of um, with my other work as well, suddenly being picked up and invited to come and perform in Brazil a number of times and Indonesia and then to Canada. And um, I think that's really opened up my perspective of, um, you know, of the world and open up my work to new audiences. There you go. Great, thank you. Nice to talk um, about Quixote. What's that? I said it's nice to talk about Quixote. Yeah, I love that show. Um, and I, I think if you're someone who does quite like to send people out of rooms and then bring them back in and see how the two, the two storylines yeah. slide into each other, the two, the two different conversations in and outside of rooms, mm. um, how they do or don't fit. Um, and I, I also think of you as someone who does like to store up books, but at the same time, it's interesting to hear about Ghostbusters and thinking about it being, you described it as a very faithful tra fan tribute act. So there's a kind of really interesting tension emerging in terms of, um, you know, what, how people would understand um, a tribute and, a, and, a, and an act of fidelity, because mm. often I think um, soaring the book up can feel like an act of fidelity, but it's not how other people would necessarily understand that act as, yeah. as an act of destruction. Yeah, I really, that's really interesting because I mean, the Ghostbusters, of course, a lot of people, it was their worst nightmare. I mean, we essentially, we, we took the film apart, you know, we, we, we took it apart and we looked at the really micro pieces. And I think there's something in that that I like to do with that other work, you know, you saw, we sawed up Don Quixote and we shredded the pages and they threw, flew through the air and the audience walked out with shreds in their hair that contained sentences from Cervantes. And have you seen Don Quixote? It's a long book. <laughs> like, it's two long books. Um, and so people would go away and they would have this thing and people would tweet afterwards, like these beautiful out of context sentences because it is beautifully written. It's a great, um, and uh, Elizabeth Showalter's um, adaptation, which we use is, is beautifully written. It's beautiful, beautifully adapted. Um, and, you know, I think there's something about People get funny about books um, and about soaring up books or tearing into books, which is also, as you alluded to, something I've done a lot with, with complete works of Shakespeare in more recent years. But you know, like, how many people have Don Quixote sat on their shelves and they're not reading page 889 who, versus the people who came to see the show and then had these, like, beautiful poems in their hair. So I think, you know, there is something about liberating, <laughs> liberating things from inside inside their covers. Yeah, turning humans into tree poetry trees. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, so Em, we've now touched on um, a great work from the early 17th century Don Quixote, uh, a great work from the late 20th century Ghostbusters. <laughs> How on earth has John Lilly's Galatea, which most people won't have heard of, and even, even um, performers and readers who know late 16th century writing well, many of them won't, won't ever have read it. How is this more, um, obscure, less well-known play ended up in your um, in your purview in, in you know in, in the world of things you want to be working with. Um, well, I mean, I think in in large regard, that's down to you and our friendship and um, <laughs> <laughs> and your passion for John Lilly. <clears throat> but um, I mean, it came about. Or, or why I, is it, why is it there? I suppose why embrace it once it is there? I, either of those questions. Well, I came, I mean, I, I came across it because, so I studied classical acting. I did a, I did a MA at Central School of Speech and Drama, classical acting, um, as kind of a mature student. Like I, I was out and I was working as an actor for a little while and I was finding as a lot of um, young actors do that I was getting cast in a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of touring Shakespeare. Um, and I felt kind of out of my depth a little bit. Like I, I have my earlier work, my earlier training was um was all more contemporary um i studied at hull university and um i did a lot of amateur dram dramatics and you know so a, a lots of stuff that was about making shows putting on shows being very kind of um uh experimental i didn't really have that grounding in what is iambic pentameter um and i was just felt that i was lacking it so i went and did this um classical acting course and i have to say i loved it i absolutely loved it it was a great year um and yeah spending a year you know classical acting on that course meant shakespeare <laughs> pretty much right. um but i had a great time doing that and then i came out of that and i think through um james wallace who was one of our uh, one of our guest lecturers on that um course and james was heavily involved with the 
with Shakespeare's Globe and with the Red Not Dead project, which is this ongoing um, project that Globe's been doing for, God, must be over 10 years now, um, where they are um, giving voice to uh, all of the plays that are contemporary to Shakespeare, right? Um, by rehearsed readings. And so I got involved with those as an actor and they were really fun. You'd come in, they'd always be on a Sunday. You rock up at 10 in the morning, you get given a part, you rehearse this five act play, you put it on at 4, 8, 4 p.m. And like oftentimes you haven't rehearsed that fire. They were very scrappy and they had a really, just a really brilliant energy. And I think I, I said before, but like with those projects, I would get the script through the post and invariably, I would read it, and this is about my, my relationship, I think, to words on a page versus words in a live context. I would read these plays and I would be like, oof, this one's gonna be, this one's gonna be a stinker. Um, don't know how this one's gonna work. Uh, and then invariably I would get there on the Sunday and, and through the brilliance of the words being spoken and a company of actors, or players, um, then they would come to life and these plays that were very dry and inaccessible to me um, on the page would be hilarious and full of life. Um, and I think there was just a period where we did all of the Lily plays back to back um, and Galatea was one of those. And I know, um, you know, James was very passionate about Lily, is very passionate about Lily's writing as well. And so that was all very infectious. And I think then fundamentally, it's just a really good play, isn't it? It's a really good play. It's really well written. And then jump forward to, I think you and I were chatting about, well, what would there be a, a, a something that we could work on that would bring these two kind of worlds together? And I kind of almost remember it being fairly arbitrary of why Galatea felt like a good choice, just like, it, you know, it being a very, well, you know, this is a nice place to start. But then the more I got invested in, in it and the more I have worked on it and like, you know, obviously very deeply now over the last few years, um, I mean, obviously we were led by that this kind of moment, this trans offer at the end of Galatea, right? In Act Five, where the two lovers, um, one of them is offered ostensibly a kind of sex change by Venus. Um, and that being like, okay, well, that's interesting to look at. What's that about? And it taking a little while to get to a point of um, a feeling that we understood that. And I mean, now I, I feel like that was the, that was the clue on the top, but it's an incredibly queer play and it's an incredibly trans play. Um, and, you know, it's, it feels very relevant to be working on it. Thank you. That was a bit um, of a waffly answer, sorry. No, no, it, at first it wasn't, but secondly, we quite like waffles on this channel. Um, uh, <clears throat> we should just unpack the play itself, I suppose, before we go any further. Um, as you say, there's a, a moment at the end of the play where Venus, the goddess of love, um, appears to offer a sex change, as you put it, to one of the characters. Um, you always give completely fabulous plot summaries to this play, so I'm, so, <laughs> I'm definitely not going to give a plot summary, but could you very briefly just give us a sense of what happens across the, the story of the play, if that's all right? Yeah, so um, it's so funny being at home, isn't it? I keep feeling like someone's going to pop out. Um, <laughs> I was about to uh, say I'm sure they won't, but I feel like that would be an irresponsible reassurance. Just in, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Um, Galatea is set in a uh, community of people who worship the god Neptune, god of the sea, um, and the deal is that every five years to keep Neptune happy they have to come together and sacrifice um, their most, um, I can't remember the wording, most eligible virgin needs to be sacrificed to um, Neptune's monster in order to keep everything hunky-dory. Um, and so the play opens and it's, it's this time um, and there's a, um, a man um, and his son, and he's explaining this whole situation. And then through that scene, we discover that it isn't his son, it's his uh, daughter, Galatea, dressed in um, boys' clothes. And they have a plan, which is to send Galatea into the woods, dressed as a boy, um, where uh, she, I mean, it's gonna do this around all of the genders, um, where she has to, uh, to stay safe. Then a couple of scenes later, another father comes on with his daughter, Philida, um, and they come up with the same um, plan. Uh, you're going to be dressed as a boy and go into the woods and, and uh, live there so that you're safe. Philida's less happy with the plan. Galatea seems pretty stoked to be wearing um, boys' clothes. Philida, less so. Um, Galatea and Philida meet in the woods. 
they have this um, sort of instant uh, attraction and love, but it, it kind of goes through many stages. They sort of have this like, oh, who's that boy? Kind of like that boy, but that boy th might think that I'm a boy. Oh, but I'm kind of into that if they think that I'm a boy. But actually, I know that boy isn't a boy. That's, a, that's not a boy. Oh, but then maybe they will know that I'm not a boy as well. Oh my, and then anyway, they give it all up. And um, as the play says, they go into the grove and make much of one another. Um, also out in the woods are, plenty, are gods um, roaming around. Lily likes to write um, about gods and uh, they encounter Diana, the goddess of chastity. Um, they encounter Cupid, little god, the, um, sort of the god of, um, what is Cupid? I mean, the Another god son, of love, really, like back up to son Venus. Of, yeah, son of the goddess of love. <laughs> um, and Cupid causes some mischief, gets, ca gets captured by um, Diana, um, and this jumping forwards, the whole um, kind of climax of the show ends where you have um, these two goddesses, Venus and Diana, at each other's throats, ready to tear apart the fabric of um, the world um, because um, Venus wants Cupid back and Diana won't give Cupid back and she's broken his bow and she's torn out Cupid's feathers and... Um, uh, Neptune has to intervene and I think I mean this has been this is a pivotal point in the show of the, that where Neptune intervenes I think in a in the Shakespeare cinematic universe or in um, other contemporary plays um, contemporary to us plays you would have this man this patriarch who's given to us as the kind of the most powerful god in the play is going to step in and just kind of shut it all down <laughs> no like end it um and actually what neptune does in calatea is um steps back and says okay i will give up my power i will stop murdering virgins and giving them to my monster if diana you give cupid back to venus and diana is a protector of virgins and so she agrees and she gives cupid back and so this whole very volatile um, situation is diffused by the patriarchal figure um, stepping back and not asserting his power. Good lesson. Um, and then the, um, the lovers come out of the woods, Galatea and Philida, and people are kind of less shocked about the fact that they are ostensible. All, all we really know about their genders is that within the society that they're living in, um, they are both perceived as female, or they're both living as as women um we can unpack that more in a moment maybe in terms of our our investigations um but people are kind of like not super bothered by the fact that it's two girls together what they are bothered about is the complications of that of course the, le the legal ramifications um and i have a son and how will he inherit and all of this kind of thing um and so venus says well look i'll make one of you into a man uh if you want and they are both like yeah cool that suits us um and diana has this kind of moment of saying can you do that i can't do that and venus is like yeah yeah i can do it i can do it but i'm gonna do it off stage and i'm not gonna tell you who it's gonna be <laughs> um which is super weird and kind of disappointing because you have this um and i think this is a reason why um previous queer academics who've been looking for um, LGB, or particularly LGB texts um, in the early modern canon um, were unhappy with this play, right? Because on the face of it here, you have this lesbian romance that right at the end of the show um, becomes heteronormative because Venus says, okay, well, one of you can be a man. Um, and that is bullshit. And that, that is something that, um, uh, but I don't think that is what, I don't think after all of our work on it, that is what's going on. And I think that that is, um, that doesn't take into account any trans reading, um, which is of course something that, um, that has been lacking in recent years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you cold? Do you want me to pause while you put your jumper on? Um, well, it'll take me a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, sort of want, I want to stall and talk while you're doing that, but at the same time, I don't want to say something that you then haven't heard because uh, that feels unfair. Um, yeah, thanks, Emma. That's really that's really helpful. Um, and um, and yeah, as you say, there's kind of been a tradition in the, in the '90s and early 2000s, a tradition of, of queer scholars being quite excited about Galatea until the end, 
um, and perceiving it as a kind of heteronormative um, heterosexual solution to to the queerness of the rest of the play. Um, but I mean, e even from a kind of heterosexual heteronormative point of view, it's a very um, unorthodox heterosexual ending because it, because it is structured around um, sex change, to use the term you used earlier, um, if that is what it is structured around, as you say. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's lots, lots to unpack there. And I guess I should say that we've been collaborating on this play now since 2016, we have quite a lot of people to thank. And by thanking them, we can kind of structure the rest of this conversation because we've worked in different phases, haven't we? So we've, um, we've been the beneficiaries of money from um, Jerwood, um, who gave us space and some financial support alongside um, the Before Shakespeare project that I was running. Um, the University of Roehampton has given us time and space to work on this project. Um, it was Hall for Cornwall, right, who funded the work in Cornwall, have I got that right? Um, it was Hall for Cornwall and Jerwood Charitable Foundation. Right. Yeah, I think Hoff Cornwall um, gave us the, a, a bit of space and time. And then... Um, and, and, and Nehi Theatre as well. And Nehi, thank you, Nehi. Um, and then another Roehampton research project engendering the stage took some of the work out to Stratford, Ontario, and Stratford themselves then brought you back a year later to work around this play in, in part? Yeah, the Stratford Festival. Stratford Festival, yeah. Um, so we've been kind of working on it in these kind of slightly curious one week, two week, windows in very different kinds of spaces in theatres outdoors yeah. in different countries do you want to talk a bit more about that process yeah i mean it's so funny isn't it like it's we've, we've worked on this show so much um and yet have never brought it to a to a production yet you know and it's so um i don't know it, all of that has been an excellent groundwork mm -hmm. for when for when, when we when we do um and yeah, I mean, I guess that those phases were really important. Um, that first phase in um, in London at the Jerwood Institute, um, that was really the first time that we um, went deeply into it. And I mean, always as well, and I mean, too many artists and performers to really list by name who'd come and worked on the project. Um, but right from the start, I kind of wanted to not, uh, I'm gonna make, I'm going to get myself into a tangle trying to make a distinction between artists and actors. And, you know, there are plenty of actors who are artists and there are plenty of artists who are actors. And, but I, and I, I don't mean a disrespect in either direction, but I think there is a distinction between the, the job and, uh, and the training perhaps of people who consider themselves um, confident actors of early modern and classical texts and more uh, contemporary artists who have a grounding in um, in devising work, particularly queer artists. Um, and I, in that, especially in that first uh, investigation, I really wanted to work with people who had a, had their own artistic practice and their own established artistic practice, really, um, alongside some actors who would be confident with the text. Um, I didn't just want a room full of people. I guess I didn't want a room full of people who just thought they knew how this kind of play was going to work. Because I think, you know, you could, I kind of always sort of come to it, but like there's a version of Galatea that I could imagine on stage in any number of established venues. And I'm like, yeah, it's good. that's fine. It will be a fine production. Kind of be like a queer as you like it if we're lucky, or, or, or they'll just make it straight. It'll be like a straight as you like it. Um, it'll just be as you like it. Um, and, you know, great. I think I endorse many productions of Lily to exist in the world, um, as there are many productions of Shakespeare, but I kind of didn't want that. I wanted to um, work with a company that would feel more comfortable, kind of taking it to pieces as needed and would have um, you know, less inherent reverence for the text. And I guess what was remarkable in that first week was then we had this amazing room um, of people who had not worked with, with each other, who'd come from all over the place, and like some from London, some from Cornwall, people from um, the north of England, um, and uh, how everyone kind of fell in love with Galatea um, in that week. And then there was a point, I think, on like the fourth day or something, where Leah Scragg, who was the editor of the, the edition that we've been working with, and Leah came into the room and people were so like, so honored to meet Leah because, you know, um, uh, she 
edited this text that we've been working with and th that was great and i was like okay this is this something exciting is happening here because here are you know here are, are artists who are not just going to kind of give it up for any old text and everyone you know we, we were finding stuff in it so that that was really good and i think that um that week just kind of proved to me that there was a lot of good stuff there i mean it was also the first time we worked with um first time i worked with uh deaf artists as well deaf performers um and that was something that really um has really transformed and and kind of um uh become a feature of of the work on this project kind of at all stages as well um and that was really exciting and at the sorry go on well i just wanted to is it right to follow ask a follow-up question to some of that yeah 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 i mean I, I guess um i'd like to hear a bit more about i mean for me that was one of the most transformative things for me as well was the the collision the exciting collision and again it's going to that thing that you like to do of bringing people into a room who have been separate um, yeah and yeah what does it mean to bring um contemporary devising based um what, uh, artists um particularly working around around queer issues to classical texts which in in mainstream theater um generally kind of divide those two constituencies right what does it mean to to bring those two together I mean, I think it's where I, I think I sit in a really um, uh, I'm trying to think what the right word is, actually. I was going to say unique. No, it's not unique. Is it fortunate? Well, you know, I don't know. I sit in a place where I'm very comfortable um, as someone who's um, had that background and experience of classical theatre world and academia. Like I can I can sit and I can feel confident um, in those spaces um, without, I think, being kind of overly seduced by them. And also I can sit in the, in the other, in other worlds quite comfortably as well. And so it's interesting to me to be able to bring people together um, and to try and to be able to um, facilitate that not being kind of either party feeling um, uh, less than in that relationship um and i think that that's that's something that um that's really that's really key to kind of where my practice is in, in this project um sorry what was the rest of the question <laughs> I mean, that's perfect that's perfect i mean i think it raises all sorts of questions as well about um Gal galatea um which is a play um with a huge number of women in it um a play with mostly working class humans in it give or take the odd massively powerful god um it's a play which is sort of asking slightly different questions about demographics and status um as a text as well i guess but i'm sorry i stopped you you're talking about joe but um do you want to tell us some more about other phases of the work and also the potential ways in which those phases link towards a, what a production might look like yeah well i think i mean the there was a key moment for me at the end of that first week. I mean, God, so many key moments, so many key moments. Oh, so many wonderful moments. Um, but um, a, a key moment was working with um, Krishna Ista. Um, Krishna is a, um, is a great uh, comedian and writer and uh, artist. Um, and one day um, Krishna had been reading for Galatea, I think, and Krishna is um, transmasculine, um, and we had in our in our minds in that first week of saying, okay, well, you know, Galatea, crudely, Galatea is really comfortable in the male sort of disguise that um, that they're put into. Philida is not. Maybe Galatea is transmasculine in some respects, and we were like exploring that. There were a number of um, of, of trans um, trans men and and. Um, and trans performers who were, who were looking at that part. Um, and I remember Krishna coming back towards the end of the week and being like, I've just had a thought on the way in. Um, what if it isn't Galatea that's trans masculine? What if Philida is trans feminine? And I mean, this always feels like a real watershed moment for me because, you know, as, a, as someone who identifies as a trans woman, um, as trans feminine myself, it hadn't occurred to me that Philida would be a trans woman. And I think that's about my own internalized shame and trans misogyny and the fact that um, the world tells us that trans women cannot really be romantic, valid romantic um, characters. 
uh, and that it was easier for me to imagine Galatea as being a, a, a transmasculine person falling in love with a cis woman. And so that kind of blew me away. And there wasn't really time to go into it in that, in that week. It was all a bit too kind of late in the day to get my head around it. Um, so then we came, we had the time at Roehampton and specifically then that was to kind of really to, to look at this question of, OK, well, what would it be like if Philida is trans feminine? And I think that just that simple kind of exploration really blew apart the genders of the lovers entirely because we were also really I remember Angela Clerkin um, bringing up in that first week about like, well, you know, it's great, the trans narrative, but it, this also seems like a really important lesbian historical narrative and, and we don't want to lose that. And so you're being like, yeah, how is there a way of honoring both of these worlds? And I think we found it when we were working in Roehampton. Um, and in Roehampton, we were working with um, uh, and Emily um, Jo Miller um, was playing Philida as a trans woman. And we had um, Kyron Stamp playing Galatea as a non-binary um, uh, person and there was this kind of like great sort of oh, fluidity is a really charged word I think but I don't want to use it lightly but like kind of this world where you had this trans woman being told that she had to dress as a man and that becoming very stressful for her but then her coming into the woods meeting this person who's assigned female at birth but is um, is non-binary and is more fluid than that and something in their meeting allowing them to kind of move through all kinds of like gender roles i think it's radical to get a trans woman to play into her to lean into her masculinity um in a production i'm never asked to do that as a performer I'm never allowed to do that um outside of my own work um and so you know working with those actors and kind of taking on to bringing into it their real lived identities yeah. um you know that really kind of unlocked a whole load of things that really then we got to the bit at the end where venus says well i make one of you a man and you think, well, that's like the most boring thing that Venus could offer, really, because actually they've come out of the woods and they're both in this sort of like this, this euphoria of, of being all the things. It's like, well, they're not, they're, you know, they, it's reductive to say, I'm going to make you a man. It's reductive to say, I'm going to make you a woman. They're both people who are living as under a female identity in this world. And I think that kind of honors the, the, the lesbian, the gayness of their relationship but they're certainly not really in man-woman territory. And then we thought, well, maybe, maybe actually Venus is just um, bullshitting and she can't do that at all. Um, and the fact where Diana says, Diana challenges it and says, can you do that? Is because gods can't do it because they can't, like you can't have a God just kind of um, force somebody's um, biology to change. And what does that even mean? And it's all kind of, like you know it's just too complicated and, and silly um but what if venus is saying that because venus knows that in order to exist in that society for their relationship to have a chance they need the status of a man and a woman because that's the that's the makeup of valid relationships in that society and so she's not saying i'm literally she's not saying i'm gonna like magic you um a penis suddenly or whatever it is that we choose to define men by um she's just saying i'm going to give you that status and we don't need to tell anyone who it is we just need to say this is now a valid relationship i don't know it's kind of complicated but we had a good time at roehampton university it's the shorthand for that <laughs> <laughs> uh my employer will be very pleased to hear that uh, and i'm pleased to hear that too well i was there i, I was pleased at the time uh, that that happened um, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, just to let you know, we've got just under 10 minutes. So I'm, just, I'm mm. trying to think about how best to structure um, the rest of the conversation. But some of the things coming out so far um, are the way in which you, you are so brilliant at centering everyone in a room. Um, and certainly uh, at Jovid, where we had the kind of the large, probably the largest company I've worked with you in, um, it felt like uh, a lot of people who were used to working um, on solo work or in smaller groups suddenly found themselves a part of this, this enormous company. And, and so often fringe theatre is around smaller casts for purely kind of economic reasons. And to, to have this kind of large scale cast where it felt like everyone was centred and no one was being asked to kind of bear the burden of representing diversity in a way which often happens in classical theatre in, in mainstream um, shows. 
I wonder if we could start to talk a little bit more about that as we think about um, wrapping up the conversation around Galatea. Well, let me let me talk. Let's if if we jump over the the two weeks we did in Cornwall, which were um, which were kind of more getting into the characters of the show, weren't they? We did a week looking at the mortals, and then we did a week looking at the gods, and, and that was fantastic. Um, but if I could talk about the the work I did in Stratford last year, um, and that I think um, there's something about yeah no, no one person having to bear the the kind of the burden of representation which is an impossible task anyway right because you know how can how can one person represent anything because of the the complexity and of and the intersections of identities um and i think what was that's one thing that is great about classical writing is that often they have large casts and that's something that um more marginalized groups we don't get to explore having large companies um through finance um mostly we're we're you know reduced to having one or two or three people on a stage um so being able to work with larger companies has been fantastic and in stratford um i had uh, a company of 15 actors who were the part of the cast of the musical Billy Elliot. Um, so they were fantastic and they were all um, cisgender ident identified, but um, they had a, a lot of other um, intersecting identities within that company. And then I had seven trans and two spirit ident uh, identified um, performers, um, six from Canada and one who came from the UK with me. And I think what was great about the seven, this kind of core group of seven trans, um, trans and two spirit people was that there was a kind of affinity for everyone with at least one other person in the group um, based on an other identity to being trans whether that was um, being a transsexual or being a person of color or being black or being um, um, a woman or wh whatever those identities were they really kind of played out which meant that the whole group um, uh, no one felt that they were alone in championing their their identity um and i think that galatea is a really um has been a really great play to work on um with these companies because it's a very equal equally based like the the the, the parts are very um equal in their <laughs> in their size and in their importance yeah. you know galatea is a play that has five lead characters arguably who are all um uh female identified or non-binary um and so you know that's remarkable it's almost like whatever part you pick up has the same kind of status and importance as um as other parts um so yeah that work in stratford um you know really took me forward because even in the work that we'd done together there had still been a, a very small number of trans identified people in each of the rooms and suddenly having this kind of large group of trans people, um, I, I don't know, it kind of felt like, um, I think what we proved was that we can kind of go down the road of being like, finding an interesting trans narrative for Galatea and Philida, but that doesn't stop many of the other parts being played by trans artists and being like, oh yeah, so what if Cupid is played by a trans performer and Cupid becomes a trans person? What if Venus is trans. What if, um, you know, the um, Rafe is a trans guy? Like, and actually, kind of opening up the fact that just because you're saying, just because you're exploring a topic with one character, doesn't mean that that can't then exist for other characters. Um, so I don't know. It was great. And coming back to write what you said at the beginning, because we need to wrap up. So we're going to do a callback. Um, is was about um, how uh, you you were talking about the. Um, the kind of the finance and the status of classical work versus a lot of more contemporary queer work and i think that it was a nice way of saying that i don't often have very much money in my productions um what was great about working with stratford and working with the uh the weight of that organization stratford international festival is um is i think they say they're the largest um classical theater oh, well, but, largest company with a focus on classical theater in North America, um, having the kind of the weight and the status of that company, exploring 
a queer text was remarkable being like you know having the access to costumes that we could have having the access to a large company having the like amazing talent of the billy elliott company who could just like bash out songs and dances and and stuff and i don't know it it, it may there's no reason that the queer work has to happen in reduced circumstances you know the reason for that is um political rather than anything else um and so i I do want to um, my my kind of my ambition for this production as it goes forward is to be able to work with with a scale with with a kind of a scale and a status and and resources. I feel like I went a little bit round the houses on that answer. <laughs> no, we love it. We love it. Um, Emma, we're closing these videos just by asking a final question, which is um, what oh. the word literature means to you, whether it's a good, bad word, a useful word, an unhelpful word in your professional work or your private life um any thoughts i think it's interesting because at the beginning i when i realized i'd forgotten to think about this question i thought oh, i don't really have a relationship to literature in my work and then actually <laughs> i'm like oh yeah don quixote like that's <laughs> a piece of literature oh yeah like you know all of the early modern and the shakespeare that i, that I work with and you know ghostbusters i mean it's all of these things i think it's like what do we um i so I think if I take it to mean a kind of a pre-existing kind of body of stuff that's out there, um, I personally do like going back, finding something and then taking, taking from it and cannibalizing and, and chopping it up and moving forwards. But I guess the key thing would be, I resist the idea that literature is something that just sits on a shelf and is dusty, um, that actually you've got to like, you've got to activate the object itself right you know you've got to take the thing out and bring it um and yeah, make, make it alive by shaking shaking the pages out or tearing the pages out or um you know getting into it i love that emma i think we should close <laughs> with the catchphrase activate the object which is advice <laughs> multi-purpose advice for life <laughs> thank you so much thank you it's been really great and and um yeah see you soon thank you bye